Convolutional neural networks are really great for image processing, so let me tell you how they work. And I don't want you to think that convolutions can't be used with other methods, because they can. And in fact, uh, we talked about convolutions when we were working on um, boosting, and we talked about the Viola and Jones weak classifiers that are convolved across an image. But here, there are multiple layers of convolutions, so that's a little bit different. It's quite a lot different, actually. All right, so here I have an image, and this representation is a little bit misleading because the truth is that I'd want to separate the image into red, green, and blue layers, so I actually have sort of three images. And um, I operate on each one of those um, layers, red, green, and blue layers separately. Now, I would typically normalize the pixel values so that some are positive and some are negative, and that's going to be important in a minute. Okay, so convolve means to slide a filter over all spatial locations, and as we did for VL and Jones, we'd sum up the filter weights times the inputs. Okay, so here I'm you know, convolving by sliding this filter over all the spatial locations. At each spatial location, we multiply the filter weights times the inputs, and then add that all up, and that goes as input into the next layer of the network. Okay, so, um, I just want to put a very simple filter up here. So this kind of looks like a Viola and Jones filter. This is actually a vertical edge detector. And as I mentioned, these filter weights are not predetermined. They are actually learned. But let's just, let's just say for now that we had a filter that was learned to be negative one on the left and positive on the right. And if the image that you're working with has an edge that's right in the middle there, then, um, and it, if it had negative uh, pixel values on the left and positive pixel values on the right, then when you multiply and sum up, you get a very large value. And so that's how the filter is detecting that vertical edge. Now, a stride of five means that we're going to step by fives when we convolve. So uh, when we pass the filter over the image, we now step by fives. And then we record the information in the next layer of the neural network, which is now a factor of five smaller in both dimensions of the image. Now the thickness of the next layer is the number of filters that we convolve with, because we can convolve with any number of filters that we like. And when we, we're gonna learn all of those filters, so hopefully they're all gonna be different from each other. Okay, and so that information gets passed onto the next layer and then there's an additional layer after that that's doing the same operation, and so on and so forth. I have here an image of Lynette 5, and you can see that it's using convolutions at every layer to kind of summarize the information that's in the previous layer. So it's like if you want to summarize a novel, you take notes on each page, and then you summarize the notes from each page into a, notes for each chapter, and then you summarize the notes from each chapter into the notes for the entire book. Okay, so, um, I, there's there's these layers of convolutions, and then there's there's sort of something special that happens at around that point, where in, where you sort of stop summarizing, and then there's fully connect, connected layers at the end. So it's like doing some learning. Um, it's doing like you know uh, a, a more complicated transformation um, toward the end, rather than summarizations of what was of of what was in the layers before it. Okay, so there's a fundamental change in the network at that, at that point. Now, a nice way to understand why these filters act as summarizations of what's in the of what's in the layer before is to think about max pooling. Okay, so max pooling means to convolve with a max function. So intuitively it keeps track of whether an earlier filter has detected something. So let's say we ran our vertical edge filter from the previous slides uh, across the image, and there was a vertical edge, and it happened to be in kind of the middle of the right where there's that eight there. You see that eight? Um, so that's where the vertical edge was in the image, and so uh, there's a very large number um, in that particular layer. So when you run a, a max pool, uh, this is a two by two max pool filter with a stride of two, and so here it's coming up with the max in each of these four squares, and you see it's preserved the eight and nothing else. So it's basically said, hey, I have detected a vertical edge. Uh, and um, all the other information is lost. So it's sort of just saying, I detected it, right? And so if you keep, if you keep doing this max pooling across layers, you'll, just, you'll, you'll get essentially indicators of what 
of what, of what filters had detected things. Now, zero padding is important because sometimes the mathematics doesn't work out and you could actually crash your code. So if you're trying to do a convolution uh, with a specific stride, uh, you could actually run off the end of the image and that's not good. So what people often do is they zero pad the image. They put uh, zeros all around the image so that the math actually works out and the code won't crash. Now I wanna talk about AlexNet for a few minutes because AlexNet competed in the ImageNet Large Scale Visual Recognition Challenge in 2012, which is a benchmark computer vision task. And the network achieved a top five error rate of 15.3%, which was more than 10.8 percentage points ahead of the runner up. So this is a really big deal. And um, the, the, I wanna tell you about the architecture of this network. Um, it's not easy to write these networks down in terms of mathematics because there are nested equations, right? You'd have to write H of G of K of the, you know, so what people typically do is they write down the architecture of the network um, in, in images. Okay, so um, the colored triangles here are showing you the sizes of the filters. And um, it's, it's showing you um, also how thick each layer is, which tells you how many filters were used um, to get from one layer to, to the next layer. So you can see that the layers become kind of fatter and thicker uh, as we go on, which means that as the layers increase, right, as, as we uh, go on deeper into the network, um, the layers are keeping track of more types of information, right? There are more filters, thicker layers, but the information from each filter is summarized more concisely, which is why the layer is smaller in terms of its other dimension. And that of course is due to the stride, right? You're summarizing the image in more ways, but each summary is more concise. So in earlier layers, you can imagine these little filters kind of scanning across the image and detecting and recording that information that goes in the next layer. And in the first layer, there are 96 different filters that detect very primitive things, like maybe little edges and things. And while it's scanning, it skips maybe every other step or something like that, so that the resulting layer is not quite as tall and, uh, as the original image. Okay, so um, it's summarizing more types of information as it goes on, but it's keeping less resolution in the, in the image for that information. And then finally, at the end, there are three standard fully connected layers. Okay, so again, there's this transition between summarizing and just um, learning at the end. Okay, so um, you can see that, um, that the architecture here really matters. It's like the, the way of, of summarizing information, more and more types of information, but in, in, it, with less precision. All right, so here's a more precise view of AlexNet. You can see some of the tricks here that you couldn't see in earlier layers. So for instance, the fact that there were actually two GPUs, um, they both had, uh, they had the same repeated architecture. Um, and then you can see that there's all this, you know, batch normalization, max pooling um, between, between the different layers. And, and the fact that they use ReLU as well. Okay, so this is just a visualization of some of the, of, of the first layer of um, AlexNet. And you can see that the learned filters, right? These are, every, every pixel in each of these filters was learned, right? And you can see that um, the filters um, in this first layer really kind of look like edge detectors or they look like sort of stripe detectors. Uh, and that's kind of cool that, that this sort of very primitive information is being captured by earlier layers that you can still understand. But then it gets more complicated in, in later layers, and uh, yeah, it, it's it's kind of progressively more and more more and more complex. Um, the the types of information that you're that it's recording, and in the later layers, um, it's sort of uh, recording like whole chunks of images that um, can sometimes be uh, very easy to understand, and sometimes be very difficult to understand. Now, if the convolutions were good then they transformed the image from pixel space into a good feature space, right? Now, I'm not completely sure about this, but I've definitely heard people say it, which is that once you do this transformation into feature space, then the rest of the network doesn't really matter. You can actually replace it with any um, learning algorithm. Like, like if you take those fully connected layers and just replace them with logistic regression, then the model you get is actually still pretty good. Um, so, um, 
if, if that's true, then you can think about the features, the, the features as bringing you into a space where the data are much more sort of Gaussian distributed, where regular machine learning methods like logistic regression ought to be able to work. So if you think about it this way, neural networks are really quite different than other methods. And the fact that neural networks are recursive uh, is really a big difference from other methods. And the fact that filters are learned rather than part of a collection of weak classifiers, that's also um, really different. But the fact that the network has this iterative rec recursive structure, it's also the reason why it's really tricky to get them to converge. And so another way to think about this uh, transformation into feature space is to think about autoencoders. So autoencoders take an image and then they run it through the convolution, convolutional layers to get these sort of latent features that I was talking about. And then they run a decoder, which sort of does the deconvolution and tries to get back the original image. Now, if the autoencoder is done everything correctly, then the latent vectors actually capture all the information you need to reconstruct the original image. So um, if, you're late, if, you're, if your encoder was good, you've transformed yourself into a feature space where you don't really lose any information that's substantial about the image. You could think about the latent vector, the, the, you could think about the um, autoencoder as creating a bottleneck in the middle where you're sort of compressing and just, for, just keeping the information you actually need um, so that you can decode. Now, there, there has been quite a lot of work since AlexNet. It's actually a very, very fast-moving field, uh, convolutional neural networks for computer vision. And so next, uh, next up, I'm going to talk about improving performance of convolutional neural networks for computer vision. Thanks.